right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the technical walkthrough call with Anvil team. Um, people are still joining, but that's fine. The call is already being recorded. And as always, we'll share the recording on our YouTube channel. So today, we're doing the technical walkthrough once again for the Anvil, um, Anvil audit competition that's currently live on the website. The reward pool is uh, $50,000. It has started a few days ago and will end on November 6. The ad stock is 1,384 lines of code, pure solidity, um, everything that you like, guys. So today we're joined by Will from Anvil team. Hello, Will. Welcome, welcome. Hello. And today he will be presenting the functionalities of the code and will give us and you, of course, the walkthrough of everything that's in there. And we can also ask him questions. So guys, um, let me know if you can type in the chat, if you can type awesome. If you can't, please do so in Discord. And I will read out loud the questions for Will. So I'm monitoring both of the chats. Um, so yeah, let's start. Will, please go ahead. Sounds good. Yeah, welcome. Um, as you can see from my screen, hopefully everybody can see my screen, um, Anvil is a decentralized finance protocol uh, for the issuance of fully secured credit. And the protocol is deployed on Ethereum. And uh, in essence, yes, users can deposit collateral into a vault, issue collateral back to letters of credit. That's part of the letter of credit contract that is outside the scope of this current competition. Uh, and then they can also um, make vault-based tokens available to collateral pools. That is part of this uh, competition. So Anvil's mission is to provide flexible building blocks to bring efficient and transparent collateralized finance to an increasingly decentralized world. How that works within our protocol is the central point of our protocol is the collateral vault where users deposit their collateral and then they're able to use that collateral in various applications. So we've talked about uh, our time-based collateral pool, as well as the letter of credit contract. Uh, and then there are potentially many more uh, contracts that could be added to the protocol to hook into the collateral vault and make use of collateral. Um, Anvil is a product of the acronym foundation. Uh, and the code that I'm talking about today is public both on Ethereum mainnet via the deployed contracts, as well as this GitHub repository, which you can see the URL for here, and it should also be in the write-up. Um, I'll share my screen and kind of point to some of the code at times during this uh, talk, but feel free to bring up the code on your own and look through it uh, as I talk about it. That might be useful. Um, yeah, so as I said, um, when you go to the Anvil Contracts project on GitHub, you'll see uh, there are many different contracts. Again, the only two that are a part of this is the Collateral Vault and the Time-Based Collateral Vault. Um, a general overview is that the Collateral Vault is just that. It's a vault that keeps all collateral for the program. So all funds at rest remain in the Collateral Vault and what we call collateralizable contracts, such as the time-based collateral pool, are able to reserve collateral, um, making that claimable in the future. Um, but when they reserve that collateral, it's still within the collateral vault. It's just a bookkeeping operation. Um, the time-based collateral pool is one of these collateralizable contracts that we're talking about that allows many different accounts to pool their all the collateral together to make a potentially large amount of collateral available to a specific claimant. So some you know, potential use cases for this sort of collateral are you know, collateralizing a payment network such that payments may be accepted instantly. And you know, if there's any fraud or issues with that, then you know, the claimant can claim against the pool to you know, make the um, payee whole. Likewise, uh, you, know, you could use this to credit bridge users with funds on the other side of a bridge instantly uh, and handle the risk associated with the finalization delay by you know, claiming from the pool if there's any issues. Uh, likewise, you could potentially credit um, 
exchange users with deposits instantly. Uh, you know, some bank transfers are very slow and uh, that delay uh, could cause issues and you could, you know, use the pool to guarantee uh, those sorts of deposits instantly. And really any other action that takes time to finalize and for which a user might reasonably pay a fee for instant finality. Uh, so two things to note about the uh, time-based collateral pool, uh, and it says it up here as well, but I'll just kind of repeat it, is um, it's just responsible for collateral access. So that is to say, it's the time-based collateral pool is just making tokens available to a claimant that is defined within the time-based collateral pool. Um, it is assumed that you know participants in the pool are providing their collateral for some reason, and there's some incentive for them to do that. But any incentive that a user might have to participate in the time-based collateral pool is external to the time-based collateral pool. So maybe there's a reward contract, or maybe there's some other reason why they're uh, providing their collateral. But that's external to the time-based collateral pool. Um, one other thing that's important to note, uh, as it's uh, already come up in it, you know, is the source of confusion is the time-based collateral pool is deployed as a singleton contract uh, that is meant to be referenced via lightweight proxies uh, via the delegate call opcode. So you'll notice that it has a permissionless initialize function, and it's easy to view that as an issue unless you consider that an, the initialize function is meant to be called as part of a proxy deployment transaction. So there shouldn't be any delay between you know, deployment and call of initialize. Anyway, I give this high level overview of the two contracts because when we talk about one of the contracts it'll be helpful to consider its interaction with the other contract and, and how they work together to support an end-to-end -end use case so diving a little bit deeper um, the collateral vault is fairly straightforward so accounts can accounts can deposit uh supported ERC-20 tokens uh, and can grant uh, supported collateralizable contracts permission to uh, use their collateral. And this permission is very similar to how ERC-20 work, where you know an account will grant a very specific amount of access to uh, a collateralizable contract. And when that collateralizable contract, say, reserves their, their collateral, it decrements the permission that has been granted very similar to the ERC-20 tokens. Now, when I say supported ERC-20 tokens um, and supported collateralizable contracts, uh, there are two different forms of support. So one, there is an owner of the contract. Right now, that is our deployed governance contracts. Uh, our, you know, that is the owner of our collateral vault, and that dictates what ERC-20 tokens are supported. And it also dictates what collateralizable contracts are supported. Uh, so you'll notice that there's um, admin functions within there that are you know, decorated with the only owner uh, modifier that makes it so that, you know, the ERC-20 tokens that are supported, the collateral tokens as we call them, and the collateralizable contracts that are supported might be mentioned by the owner. Um, so we talked about what accounts can do, you know, deposit ERC-20 tokens and, and make them available and use them with different collateral, uh, collateralizable contracts. Uh, now, approved collateralizable contracts can reserve an account's collateral so that it's claimable thereafter. Uh, and once collateral is reserved, it might be helpful here to bring up the concept of a collateral reservation. So once collateral is reserved by uh, collateralizable contract, it may be fully or partially claimed. Uh, it may be released, uh, thereby uh, allowing it to be used by some other approved collateralizable contract, or it may be modified by the, the collateralizable contract. Maybe they reserved you know, 10 tokens or something like that, but they actually only need seven or maybe they need 12. Uh, they can call a modify function to adjust a reservation. Note, if they are modifying the collateral reservation to increase the overall amount that is reserved, uh, that is subject to that ERC-20-like allowance. 
So, you know, if they had reserved 10 tokens and they try to make that 12, but the account has not granted them permission to reserve another two, uh, that operation would fail. So, see, very, um, very much a part of what we'll be talking about today is that approved collateralizable contracts may also pool an account's collateral. So this is how an account's collateral can be used by the time-based collateral pool. Um, the act of pooling an account's collateral disassociates that collateral from the account's address, and it associates it with the, the pool's address, all within the collateral. So that is a bookkeeping operation as well. You'll notice in the code that there's a map of, uh, you know, token and account address to collateral balance. So in essence, when uh, collateral is reserved for a specific token and account, the available balance of a account is decremented and the reserved balance is increased. You know, and that's to make it so that two collateralizable contracts can't reserve the same collateral. It's very important that the collateral is not rehypothecated. Uh, so when collateral is pooled, um, just like I said, the collateral balance, the available collateral balance of the specific account is decremented and the collateral balance of the pool is incremented. Uh, again, all within the collateral vault contract. So no tokens are actually transferred. This is just a bookkeeping operation within the collateral vault. Once pooled, uh, you know, collateral can be reserved and claimed and released the same way that it would be by any collateralizable contract. The concept of pooling is just, just that, pooling a bunch of collateral together to maybe accomplish a larger goal that might not be feasible for, you know, an individual account. Let's see, a few, a few potential, uh, few potentially confusing aspects of the collateral vault are the distinction between reserved collateral and reserved claimable collateral. Let's bring that up here. So, yeah, these two look somewhat similar. And I guess the first thing that we should do here is look at collateral reservation. So, as you can see, a collateral reservation is a, a piece of state that um, you know contains the collateralizable contract that has reserved that collateral, the account for which collateral is being reserved, likewise the token that is being reserved, and then the last three fields come into play for this distinction between reserved claimable collateral and reserved collateral. So when you reserve collateral, you're overall moving a specific amount from the available balance to the reserve balance. That amount is the token amount. That is the overall amount that's reserved. Now, the collateral vault, when any collateral is claimed or when any collateral is withdrawn from the protocol, uh, a protocol fee is assessed. So uh, when, say, uh, 100 tokens are reserved, actually what's claimable might only be, you know, 99 tokens or something like that. Uh, and the difference between that is uh, the fee that would be assessed if the collateralizable contract were to claim those tokens. So the difference between, uh, now it might become clear, the difference between reserve claimable collateral and reserve collateral is just that. Are you trying to reserve a specific amount of collateral that you need to be claimable? So if you need to make sure that you're able to reserve 100 tokens, you're now going to reserve more than 100 tokens because you have to account for the fee if you were to claim them. Uh, on the flip side, if it's less important the exact amount that's claimable and more important to reserve uh, an, an absolute amount of tokens, then you call reserve uh, collateral and pass in the overall amount that you would like to be reserved, some portion of that uh, being claimable in the future. So you'll see, obviously, reserved claimable collateral, you pass in the claimable amount, and it returns the total amount reserved, and vice versa for reserved collateral. Also, there are a few governable fields 
on the collateral vault. So for instance, we talked about um, the withdrawal fee that's stored on the, uh, the collateral reservation. The withdrawal fee may be updated by the owner via governance uh, at any time. Uh, the reason, as we looked at the collateral reservation, the reason that the withdrawal fee is stored on the collateral reservation is to make any updates, uh, to make a collateral reservation to any changes in withdrawal fee. So the fee at the time of reservation is stamped on the collateral reservation and any updates that happen in the future don't matter to that specific collateral reservation. And that's really important because uh, you know, these collateralizable contracts are reserving collateral so that they can guarantee that they can claim it. If, you know, that fee were to be able to change out from under them, that really loosens that agreement and makes uh, our collateral vault much less useful. So. Likewise, you know, like we said, the uh, collateralizable contracts themselves are governable and can be added and likewise can be removed uh, from the protocol. If that were to happen, um, it would make it so no new collateral reservations can be created for that um, collateralizable contract or that token. But any collateral reservations that had already been in place would continue to be in place. Uh, the only difference is that if somebody were to, uh, if a collateralizable contract were to call and specify collateral reservation and they were to try to increase the collateral reservation, that wouldn't work. Uh, since it's no longer supported by the protocol, uh, the protocol enters a decrease only. Uh, mode with respect to uh, collect. Let's see. One other thing that is potentially confusing is the owner of the vault. Uh, the owner of the vault, in our case, the Anvil Governance Contract, may withdraw tokens from the vault, but it should never be able to withdraw tokens that are associated with the account. So any account collateral balance. Uh, is not withdrawable by the owner of the contract. Um, that is to say the maximum amount uh, of a given token that is withdrawable by the owner could be the vault's token balance minus the sum of all account collateral uh, balance entries. So you might wonder how it's possible that the overall vault balance of a token is greater than the sum of all account uh, collateral balances of that token. And um, we kind of touched on it before, but uh, if tokens are withdrawn from the vault, whether that's through a withdrawal operation or whether that's through a claim of, of a collateralizable contract, a fee is assessed. And that fee is just a bookkeeping operation so that disassociates those tokens from that account and it just leaves them in the collateral vault. So now they become withdrawable by the protocol. Likewise, any tokens that are sent directly to the vault solely by interacting with the ERC-20 contract cannot be associated with an account because the collateral vault contract is not involved. So these amounts would be withdrawable as well. All right. So moving on to the time-based collateral pool. Um, time-based collateral pool, which I'll refer to as TBCP or simply pool for short, has some very simple features, uh, but with much more complex logic to implement them. So for instance, the idea that accounts may pool tokens such that a claimant can claim them is not very difficult to comprehend, but there are a few aspects of this that make it much more complex. So while collateral is pooled or staked as the TBCP calls it, it is still tracked on an account by account basis. So this becomes really important when claims happen and when an account wishes to remove its collateral from the pool, how we go about calculating what portion of that pool is now uh, you know, unstakeable and withdrawable by a specific account. So when an account stakes, that account's collateral is disassociated, as we talked about, disassociated from that account and associated with the pool contract within the collateral vault. And as a result, the account receives what we call pool units within the pool contract. The number of pool units uh, that the account receives is proportional to the tokens it added to the pool. So, you know, let's say, for instance, the, you know, there's, you know, the overall pool tokens, there's 10 tokens and, you know, pool units. 
there's 10 units, right? If somebody comes and stakes five tokens, you know, the resulting tokens are going to be 15 tokens. And therefore, you know, since they added another half of the overall tokens in the pool, the units of the pool are now increased by half as well. So now there's 15 and those five go to the staker. When we say go to the staker, that is simply associated with their account within the uh, pool contract. So this is done to keep track of proportional stake. Uh, imagine that a claimant now claims a portion of that pool and the staker wishes to unstake. The contract needs to know what portion of the remaining tokens are to be unstaked. Pool units give us just that. So for instance, if there's a claim of say 10 tokens, right? Um, now there's five tokens and 15 units in the pool. So if that staker now goes to withdraw their, um, you know, five units that they had staked, right, we would calculate the amount of tokens as, you know, five over 15, so one third times five tokens. And of course, this is not a great example because it doesn't you know, cleanly add up uh, and it's not clearly representable in integer math, but you get the, uh, the picture that this is purporting. So very related to the concept of indiv individual accounting is the concept of pool resets. Now, this gets a little bit complex, but, you know, um, the claiming from the pool, as you can see here, um, it dilutes the pool units over time. That is to say that a unit of the pool becomes worth fewer and fewer tokens as time goes on. So let's go back to this example of, you know, 10 tokens. Uh, let's go to a more extreme case than the, the five that we just talked about. Let's say that, you know, for instance, uh, claim nine tokens. So the claim comes in and claims nine tokens. So now we have, uh, we have 10 units left, right? And we have one token left. Now, somebody comes in and deposits. So let's say that that deposit happens again. Uh, somebody stakes five. Right? What are what are they going to be issued? Right? We have, they have just increased the pool by 5x. So now they're going to get 5x the tokens as well, right? So they would get, the overall result would be tokens in the pool is now six and units is now 60 and 50 of those go to the staker. So as you can see, uh, the more of the pool that's claimed, the more the pool dilutes. And if we were to take that to quite an extreme, um, let's change our initial setup here to, you know, the pool tokens instead are 1 million wrapped ether, right? So wrapped ether has 18 decimal places. And so the amount of overall way that is in the pool is going to be 10 to the 24, right? And so if we were to issue pool units uh, the same way, then we also have 10 to the 24 pool units, right? So now let's say that claim comes in instead of nine tokens, they claim all but one way, right? So now the amount of tokens that are left is one. So that's one way. And the amount of units that are left is still 10 to the 24, right? So now let's say somebody comes in and puts in one week, right? So as we know that, you know, one week is actually 10 to the 18 tokens, right? Or 10 to the 18 way, right? So now, uh, one pool unit is worth one over 10 to the 24 way. So that new staker that comes in and puts in one wrapped ETH, they've now multiplied the pool value by 10 to the 18th. So that means that they're also going to do the same with the pool units. So now the total pool units that they'll get 
is ten to the eighteenth times ten to the twenty fourth equals ten to the forty second. So, as you can see, and you know this is a rather large example, but as you can see, as this dilution happens and as it happens with large numbers and there are large claims, the number of tokens can close, you know, can approach the 10 to the 77th about value that is the UN 56. So I say all that just to say that as time goes on, it, it starts to become such that a new staker cannot accurately be represented within the pool uh, because we are pushing up against the limits of the UN 256. That is possible. It's not uh, probable in many of the real world use cases that will happen, but it is theoretically possible. So we've included the possibility for um, a resetter role to come in and call the reset pool function. So, um, so you'll see this reset pool and you can pass in which tokens you would like to reset. Um, and you'll see them write up this example and some explanation of roughly um, what we just talked about. And what happens when the reset pool function is called is it immediately unstakes all tokens uh, that all stakers have, have staked of that specific token type. Uh, and the next staker will receive one pool unit per way contributed, uh, reestablishing that one-to-one -one value. So this is kind of a nuclear option, but it makes it so that new stakers are actually able to participate in the pool. So that might be somewhat confusing. Hopefully that uh, clears up why reset pool exists. And um, hopefully that's not a part of everyday use, but that is there in case we bump up in, uh, against that situation. So one other source of complexity is the concept of an epic. So the design of the TPCP is such that uh, unstakes take at least one epic to take effect. So when a user calls the unstake function, um, it initiates the process of unstaking. And the, stake in, the staker is, in essence, giving public notice to the claimant that their stake will no, no longer be claimable in one epic. Technically, it's at the end of the epic following the current epic. Um, so it's at least one epic, but uh, at most two epics. So this concept of delayed unstakes accomplishes two different things. So first, it allows a staker to unstake without specifically requiring permission from any party. So it doesn't have to ask the, the claimant or any other party, hey, can I unstake? It's just saying, hey, I'm unstaking. You, you all now have notice in some amount of time, my funds will automatically be unstaked. Um, second, it provides the claimant a guarantee of the minimum amount of time that staked collateral is claiming. So if the claimant sees that 100 tokens are staked and no unstakes have been initiated, it knows that it can assume some financial risk up to 100 tokens in value for at least one epic. And um, you know if that risk uh, turns out to be problematic, it can claim the staked collateral uh, because it knows that it will be available. So a, a concrete example, like we talked about before, here could be an exchange giving a user credit for deposit instantly. In this example, the exchange would be the claimant. And let's say it takes two to three days for a bank transfer to finalize, but the trader is interested in claiming right now because of market conditions or something. Uh, if the TVCP epic is at least three days, at the time the bank transfer is initiated, the exchange can go into the, the pool and check to see if there's enough staked collateral to cover the transfer. If so, it could instantly credit the user with exchange funds. If the bank transfer succeeds, that's fine. It, uh, you know, everything works as planned uh, and the exchange gets its funds from the bank transfer from that exchange user. If the bank transfer fails, the exchange may go and claim the necessary funds from the pool. So, in reality, the exchange would likely freeze the user's account and only claim the delta between the value that was credited to the user and the current account value. But the point is that delta may be up to the value of the, the full value of the bank transfer. So when an account calls unstake, the pool units it would like to unstake get packaged into what we call a pending unstake. Um, that has kind of been flattened out in contract state for efficiency sake, but um, 
you can think of the concept of a pending on stake within the contract as uh, the total number of units uh, of a specific token that account would like to unstake uh, and the epic after which those units are fully unstaked. So we can kind of go up to contract state here. So you'll see in both account stake and contract stake, we have first pending on stake epic and second and, and first pending on stake units and then like second uh, on stake epic and second on stake units. So like I said, this state is flattened out. It's first and second. You can think of this as a ring buffer of size two, um, but it's much more uh, costly gas wise to actually represent it as a ring buffer. But the reason that it's size two is because it will take at most two epics to process an unstake. So that is to say that there can only be two epics worth of unstakes uh, that are pending for an account or a contract at any given time. So that's why we have the first and the second. So when the unstake epic uh, gets passed for a pending unstake, uh, the contract refers to that point in time as a pending unstake vesting. So we have unstakes that are pending and we have unstakes that are vested, meaning that they're no longer claimable. So putting it all together, there's the concept of exit balances. So this, I realize that there's a lot of information here and it all builds on each other. So um, I'm glad this is being re reported because it might not make sense now, but you might come back to it later uh, as these concepts start to get more solidified. So the concept of an exit balance. So as we said, when an account tries to unstake, it is giving notice to uh, the claimant that after uh, at most two epics, but at least one epic, uh, the amount that it would like to unstake is now not going to be claimable. So what an exit balance does is it keeps track of an exchange rate for that specific unstake epic. So, you know, there's the units that are a part of that on stake and there's tokens that are a part of that on stake. This is necessary because once on stake is called by an account, that account's collateral will, like we said, no longer be claimable after the epic, after the current epic, even if that account does not take any further action. And for everybody here is familiar with the fact that uh, changes don't happen on the blockchain, state modifications don't happen unless a transaction is submitted. And what I'm saying is, even if no transaction is submitted after an unstake call, we can guarantee that those uh, that that collateral will not be claimable after the epic in which the unstake vests. So the way that that's implemented is you'll see this modifier with eligible account tokens released. Um, so, and you'll see something uh, similar for uh contract state as well so what that means is after the end of an epic of an unstake vesting the next operation that would modify pool units or the stake tokens first processes uh account or uh, contract level unstakes uh, making sure that uh, basically making sure that all of that collateral is now removed from the claimable portion and the uh, unstaked units are removed from the total pool units as well. So, yeah, what happens when this uh, contract level unstake is processed? Um, so you might have, you know, a couple different accounts that have tried to unstake and say that like uh, on Epic 42, the their unstakes will be vested. So let's say, for instance, there's two accounts and one unstakes five units and the other unstakes 10 units, right? So in the contract state, um, let's say there's no other pending unstakes or anything like that. The first pending unstake epic here would be 42. Um, the first pending unstaked units would be 15 because we said one account has five, the other account has 10 um, for a, a total um, well, and total units is uh, the total amongst both of them. 
Um, so what happens now as a, a precondition within this, with eligible account tokens released is uh, before any operation that would modify pool units can take place after that epic is passed, the contract process is unstaked by calculating the amount of collateral the unstaked units represent. So we have the first pending unstaked unit in this case, and we have the total pool units that are associated uh, with that token as well um, as a part of uh, yeah, contract state here. Uh, so it can say, you know, what proportion of the overall pool are these unstaked units? For instance, we talked about 15 units being unstaked. Let's say, you know, for convenience that there's 150 units in the pool. So that's pretty easy to say one tenth of the pool is now being removed. So now uh, the contract can calculate that proportional amount of collateral in its collateral reservation that it has reserved, and it can call the modify function to modify it, lessening the amount reserved by uh, 10%. So in this case, uh, yeah, uh, assuming it's one to one and there's one, 150 tokens, it would be 15 tokens as well. But again, that's proportional. So it modifies the underlying collateral reservation and then it creates an exit balance. So we have units left in this case would be 15 and tokens left in this case would be 15. And it stores that in a mapping associated with the epic itself. So now what that does is it makes it so that those tokens are not uh, claimable by the claimant and those units are no longer a part of the pool, but uh, those tokens have not yet been uh, actually released to the accounts in question. At some point in the future, whether the account wants to specifically call release for its tokens or whether it wants to do some other operation, uh, you know, whether that is a stake or a new unstake, um, as a precondition uh, for the account, it will call this with eligible account tokens released. And what that does is it goes and it looks at the accounts uh, pending on stakes, if there's any unstaked epics, and it checks in the exit balance for token epic exit balances. And it says, okay, for this epic that you have a pending on stake, is there an exit balance? And if there is, let's look at how many units you have and let's take that out of the exit balance. So let's say account one had five units uh, in a pending unstaked that unstaked in Epic 42, comes in at Epic 45 and wants to do some sort of operation um, that would, you know, let's say they want to stake. Um, what would happen first is it would look up, uh, you know, it would see the first unstaked Epic as 42, it would look it up in this mapping, find that there is in fact an exit balance, uh, then it would say, okay, you have five pending on state units. Uh, let's go and figure out how many units are in that exit balance. And it would say, okay, there's 15 there. So you have five over 15, one third. Uh, again, with an math, I keep on coming to a third for some reason. Um, and then it looks at the tokens that are left and there are 15 tokens left, it says, okay, one third of those tokens are now uh, released disassociated from the pool contract within the collateral vault and now reassociated with the accounts uh, address within the collateral vault. And the exit balance is decremented. And the reason the exit balance needs to be decremented is because of what we were talking about there with the one third with the integer math, um, it's probable that uh, there is some truncation and uh, as a result, we don't have a perfect amount of units in the end. So whoever the last uh, account is to you know, ultimately process an unstake and, and remove it from the exit balance, it's the remainder, uh, which should be dust, but um, it's a, a clean accounting operation there. So yeah, so that should, explain exit balances and uh, some of the nuances of account state and contract state and this um, with eligible account tokens release modifier that is a precondition to uh, many of the operations that you can see within the time-based collateral pool.
the last, hopefully last, potentially confusing part of the TBCP is that the time-based collateral pool, as you can see based on the mappings here, um, supports multiple tokens. So that is to say that a single pool may have stakers staking 10 different ERC-20 tokens, each of which has its own unique set of pool units. So you can kind of conceptualize this mentally as 10 distinct pools, uh, you know, one pool per ERC-20 token, but they're all contained in this single pool context. So that makes things a little bit more complex, but um, you just know what, what exact set of units and what exact set of collateral you, you're interacting with based on the, the first key to everything, which is, uh, or the second key in this case, the token address. All right. So I think I got through a bit of what I wanted to talk about. And you'll notice I didn't dive into any of the specific code because you know the code itself is hopefully pretty readable and has a bunch of documentation. But these high-level concepts of like what the mechanics are and what the code is meant to implement and why it's so complex in certain cases hopefully make it make a little bit more sense. Um, that said, I think I'll take a breath and allow anybody to ask questions that they might have. This was a very detailed presentation. Thank you so much, Will. Um, guys, yes, yeah, feel free to drop your questions either in the chat or in Discord. One question that we have received so far, Will, is from Mohammed. So I'm sure if this was covered, is there a documentation that we can read that explains what has been presented? And um, there was like, um, and this question was unwrapped in Discord too, uh, that this guy also read uh, the materials presented on the back bounty page, but he was looking for a technical flow. So something related to what you was covering during the call. Is there anything like that, that Whitehead can study? Um, we have something like this internal to Anvil, but we haven't uh, made it public yet. Uh, I will uh, I will talk with the team and, and try to get that out as soon as possible. For now, obviously, like this presentation can serve as that, but obviously it's sure. hard to you know uh, search through it uh, in a text-based way and quickly get to what you want. So um, yes, that's a very reasonable question, and uh, we can and should expose documentation like I just talked about at a read read. At least something, right? At least something. Um, right. One more question from Pixel. Uh, isn't there any test scripts of this contract? Yes. Yes. So actually in a different repo uh, that is internal to the Anvil team, we have, you know, fuzz tests and unit tests that have 100% coverage of each uh, branch. Uh, We've made the conscious choice not to expose that publicly, um, just because, uh, and unfortunately, this means it'll make your job harder. Uh, we don't want to let anybody know what sort of things we focused on testing more and what sort of things we focused on testing less. Uh, we just, it is important for us to know that we've tested everything to the best of our ability, but we feel like sharing that publicly uh, would do more harm than it would do good. Valid answer. Thank you. Um, well, one question from me is, can you maybe cover, so we have 12 minutes left. Can you maybe cover main findings that you received from previous audits and any, uh, any known issues which are, which are not fixed, but still kind of, you know, out of interest, maybe out of interest for whiteheads? Sure. Um... Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. So main findings, the main findings that we're worried about is what you would imagine for most DeFi protocols. So any ability to uh, freeze tokens within a contract such that they're not recoverable um, or the ability to steal tokens from a contract. So for the time-based collateral pool, we're slightly less concerned about theft, seeing as the time-based collateral pool never actually has any tokens even you'll see that there's a function called deposit and stake and that simply calls um wherever that is down here. that simply calls deposit from account within the collateral vault contract so um 
at no time does the time-based clutter pool ever actually hold any token. Um, other than, yeah, obviously, like somebody to directly transfer the University 20 token to the contract. And so one thing that has come up is, and obviously, um, you can see we talked a little bit about, well, actually, we talked at length about this with eligible account tokens released modifier that is called as a precondition of deposits and, uh, you know, uh, basically any state modifying call within uh, the time-based collateral pool. And that does some complex math, right? It uh, goes through and it calculates all the, the different um, tokens that should be made, uh, you know, like uh, removed from the payable balance of uh, the contract itself. So since it does really complex math and since it's called as a precondition to pretty much all external functions, um, it's extremely possible that there's some sort of error in the logic that then causes tokens to be uh, in essence locked, right? If any of that logic reverts, then we can't call deposit mistake, right? And, um, you know, for instance, uh, the claim function, you'll see also um, it doesn't use that modifier exactly, but it uses uh, one of the functions that that modifier calls, basically making it so that uh, any tokens that shouldn't be claimable are not in fact claimable uh, at the time that it claims. So if there was any issue with that logic, that would in essence make it so the claim is not possible, uh, which completely undermines the whole purpose of so. So that is that is a potentially large issue that um, there was a small issue that was found um, in one of the audits uh, relating to that. Basically, on deposit, uh, you know, we, yeah, you'll see when somebody tries to stake, uh, let's go to this function call here. So when somebody tries to stake, it's possible that the amount of tokens that they're trying to stake uh, would then increase the overall pool units higher than that UN256 value. So that was a case that was definitely found in one of our audits where we were missing this specific check that you can see here. And um, it was causing an issue where we would actually process a deposit um, that was too large. And then that would make it so that um, no future uh, calls were possible to um, you know, unstake or to claim or anything else. So here we check on deposit or on stake, I should say, to make sure that the number of units issued are not in excess of the supported value of um, the UN256 type. And that has mitigated that issue. So like I said, this is one of the one of the worries, like we've caught this specific issue, but one of the worries is that we have some sort of issue like this where um, that logic that is uh, preconditioned to much of our other logic uh, consistently reverts and tokens are stuck. So that is also part of the reason that we've, um, you know, decided to deploy the time-based clutter pool as a singleton that is referenced by uh, proxies. And we are um, strongly encouraging the protocol to only uh, add collateralizable contracts that are proxies that are specifically um, are upgradable via a beacon that is also controlled by governance. And so what that would do is, of course, if some sort of issue like this were discovered in the future, it would allow um, a contract upgrade to be proposed to governance that addresses the issue and makes tokens um, actually uh, unlocked and, you know, in essence, solves the, the problem moving forward. If we didn't do that via proxies, obviously, we'd have a much larger potential of keeping tokens locked for um, and then so that was one of the issues that was found uh, that we addressed that was you know one of the main ones that we we're worried about i'm sorry uh what was the other question you asked um i i believe this was uh so the any any it's just raised from audits and then any known issues that might be in the protocol. Yeah. Um, any known issues? No. Um, so obviously, like as we've talked about, uh, and it's in the write-up, uh, 
you know, if you view the time-based collateral pool as a contract that you would deploy by itself, um, there's an issue in that the initialized function is not protected, so anybody could call it. Um, that said, uh, we are strongly encouraging everybody to not deploy it by itself and instead reference our deployed version of it with their proxy. So their proxy would call initialize on, de or on deploy. So um, that looks like an issue, but it shouldn't actually be an issue. Um, let's see what else. Oh, one other thing is, you know, there's within the uh, collateral vault, right? There's a withdrawal fee that is assessed on, uh, you know, any claim or any withdrawal. We're dealing with integers, obviously, so there will be truncation on, you know, those those fees when they're calculated. And so the protocol had to make a decision of would we like to potentially overcharge users that fee or would we like to undercharge them? And so in the case that there's, let's say, one unit or one way uh, of truncation, uh, the user would be charged one way less instead of one way more than whatever the fee is. Thank you.